Well, my apologies for the delay. Um, outside of wanting to get some stuff done for, um, well, hopefully in time for Worldcon, and um, getting COVID, which was an experience. Um, I this ended up being much later than I intended, so my apologies for that. In any case, um, it's time to return to Nintendo Power, covering issue 98 for July of 1997. We should have some fun titles to cover this issue as we have Star Fox 64 on the, um, on the slate of games to cover this issue. So, let's get started. As mentioned before, our cover game this issue is Star Fox 64 with some additional mention of Dark Rift and International Superstar Soccer 64, which is basically all three of the N64 games we're covering. In the letters column, we have our recommendations for what we want for issue, or what the readers want for issue 100, including several legitimately good ideas, like a timeline of the magazine and of Nintendo itself as a company, a cover gallery for all 100 issues, a return of Nestor, and even bringing up the good old-fashioned classified information envelopes for the issue. I approve of all of these. There's also a recommendation to do a ranking of the top 100 games on Nintendo consoles, of course, of all time as of that issue. That one's interesting from a historical discussion debate standpoint, but as you've been following this channel for a while, I you know that I personally can't be bothered to rank lists, so I don't care that much for a game where, for where it falls on the list, just so long as it's on the list. In the power charts, Killer Instinct Gold returns to the N64, and both Tetris and Tetris Attack return for the Game Boy. Now, it bears mentioning that outside Lost Vikings 2 being consistently at the bottom, we haven't really had any new titles as far as like the past year or so on the Super Nintendo chart, to enough of a degree that I do think it might be a better choice to shrink the Super Nintendo list to 5 and expand the Game Boy list to 10, just to note what other Game Boy titles are sticking around on that lower half of the rankings, uh, particularly since the two going concern platforms at this point are the Game Boy and the N64. Either that, or just go back and rock to and rock this thing like we did in the uh, in the old in the earlier days when the um, like when it was the, when the Super Nintendo and the uh, Game Boy, and we make this a, a two-page rankings. But in this case, we have each platform getting. Uh, top 10, as opposed to one getting short shrift with a top 5. Our first game this issue is Star Fox 64, our cover title. We have some notes on our three different vehicle types for uh, this game, instead of just piloting the R-Wing. We also get notes on several different level types, from your standard on-rails corridor mode levels, along with some more wide-ranging all-range mode levels. We also get a map of the Lilat system, with notes on various planets and the various possible routes to the final boss level of the game, along with notes that you could potentially end up fighting a robot duplicate of Andros instead of fighting him directly. We also got a full map of Mission 1 and some notes on Mission 3. Clippy, watch out. Star Fox 64, on the one hand, plays pretty well as an on-rail shooter. On the other hand, unfortunately, it doesn't have the granularity when it comes to aiming that the game really calls for, particularly regarding some of the boss fights, even in early levels. While the game now has a lock on option where you can hold down the fire button to charge a shot and lock onto uh, some enemies, that sort of thing, it doesn't quite go as far as I think it merits going. Um, having something a little closer to, say, uh, a Panzer Dragoon level of lock on. Also, like, while it's the boss's weak points. Well, there's a degree of auto-aim that helps with that. Um, it's not as generous as it needs to be. Um, particularly regarding certain some bosses where it's a fairly small target and moving your reticle with the D-pad of the N64 controller is just finicky enough that it becomes tricky to get that shot in. Especially against some bosses where hitting or missing or target, or in some cases, like just be like just around it, can actually end up having a 
negative repercussions. Counterattack or recharging it. That's right. Oh, so when it, my view is if a stage of a boss fight takes longer than you like, not because it's hard and you haven't figured out the pattern, but because you're finding yourself struggling with the controls, where it's, where you've figured out how to dodge the enemy attacks and you can survive just fine, but it's just a matter of just doing this one instruction to the level of, with the level of precision that the game requires. That's a cause for frustration. That's not fun. That said, this is a solid improvement on the original Star Fox. The polygonal graphics feel better. Uh, we have fully voiced dialogue this time. Um, the music feels stronger. There are things to like here. There are ways which this is a marked improvement. It's just the targeting never quite worked. Next up is Dark Rift, a 3D fighting game published by Vic Tokai. And we have a bunch of notes on the various characters in the game's cast. Dark Rift is unfortunately clunky fighting game. The animations are a little sluggish and lumbering, even with my using a character with, which is going from the character design and description is theoretically meant to be more of a quick and sprightly fighter. Now this was the, like some of the early 3D fighting games, like a Virtual Fighter 1 or a Toshinden kind of work. But at this point in the game industry, in where we're at with 3D fighting games, Tekken 3 is on the way in arcades, um, Tekken 2 is already out, like Dead or Alive, we're coming up on Virtual Fighter 3. 3D fighting games have progressed considerably by this point. And this is like one of the first big 3D fighting games on the N64. There's an opportunity to take here Take what has been learned by these other titles and carry that over to the system. And it's not really the case. That's where it's fortunate. Like, we're in a situation where Namco, Sega, and Takara have all demonstrated, on, admittedly on other platforms, really solid examples of how to do with a solid 3D fighter. And this one missing the mark to this extent, that's what makes it such a shame. Now, the developer, Chronos Digital Entertainment, would move on to doing the Fear Effect Horror series on the PlayStation, which honestly probably works better uh, for this type of gameplay in terms of a 3D sort of semi-action, semi-horror-ish game. Um, and I definitely get from that why the, the sense that that game fits to their strength in terms of what they've figured out and how to handle a 3D game in that respect. Next up is International Superstar Soccer 64. Konami has a soccer game on the N64, which will eventually become the Winning Eleven series on other platforms. We have notes on creative players and general gameplay, along with the team rankings. There's also a rundown of some of the game's scenarios in here, where the game drops you in a specific gameplay situation and asks you to try and pull off the winning move. I'm assuming some of these are based on actual historical matches. And there's the Superstar Soccer 64. Um, plays well, but not as well as I'd like. When it comes to like an actual matchup and opponent when controlling the ball carrier, and I'm, or ball, the person with the ball, and I'm moving forward and I run into an encounter defender. I, it feels like I lose complete momentum when it comes to moving in any direction. Makes it almost impossible for me to try and juke around the defender or reverse, even reverse direction to try and pass to an open player. It makes the game actively frustrating. Um, it feels like I'm losing a lot of matchups and ending up with a lot of loss of possession that, that I would otherwise. It makes what could have been a more enjoyable game very frustrating. I mean, like, in all seriousness, the game is, graphics are very fluid. I'm very impressed. Yes, this is both played with an emulator, so there's a degree of uh, anti-aliasing and that sort of thing going on here, because, again, I'm running into technical issues for gameplay capture, but still, it, it looked great. And the... A commentary is also far better than I expected. It does get repetitive, but it's otherwise smooth. It's seamless when going between um, chunks of commentary. I could certainly see where if I were playing this 
over the course of playing a full season over several weeks that this would start to get tedious but i'm certainly enjoying what i was listening to like, way better than i expected considering the era and also considering this is a cartridge based console as opposed to on a disc based system be it the saturn or the playstation usa have a lot to do Moving on to the online updates, uh, Nintendo is cutting loose from AOL and now has their own website with a whole bunch of updates on what you can find there, or at least find there in, you know, the 90s. Next is Hexen. We have several more level maps um, covering some of the later levels of the game, particularly the Seven Portals chunk of levels. This follows up with more level coverage for Blast Core, covering some of the expert level stages of the game. I've reviewed both these titles, Hexen and Blast Core, so I'll be giving them a miss. This now. EA3 1997 is coming up, and we have a rundown of a bunch of the games that are going to be shown at that event. We have several rare titles showing up, with Banjo-Kazooie and GoldenEye due to come out, along with Conger's Quest, which doesn't get a release. Nintendo has Zelda 64, Star Fox 64, and Yoshi's Island 64. And also we have some screenshots of Earthbound 64, which does not come out, but it's interesting seeing this additional gameplay coverage here. As far as third party, other third parties go, we have Mischief Makers from Enix, Body Harvest from DMA Design, or Rockstar, and Tetrisphere. We also have one of our first big wrestling titles to come out the US side of things with WCW NWO World Tour, which I believe you correct is from Aki. So this is the first of the big Aki um, N64 games. Oh, and Konami has a uh, Pretty good slate of titles coming up as well, with Goemon 5, or Legend of the Mystical Ninja 64, and then Dracula 3D, or Castlevania 64, as it's released here. Now, the most important game this issue, more or less beyond a shadow of a doubt, is our first in-depth look at a little import Game Boy title called Pocket Monsters. It's not called Pokemon yet, in terms of the official title, but the term does come up in the article in terms of the monsters that you're capturing. We have a rundown of the premise and the mechanics, including trading your Pokemon and dueling your with your friends over the link cable, and we even get a mention of the anime series. But at this point, there is no information as yet on this title coming out in the U.S., and so in turn, no information as in, like, when we can expect to get on the Game Boy, and thus when this is going to change the fortunes of the Game Boy considerably as a platform. The Blast Core comic continues as the team finishes being put together. In Counselor's Corner, we have more tips for N64 games, particularly Shadows of the Empire and Turok. We have a new Game Boy title this issue. It's based on a Disney film, and it's not a minigame collection. It is Disney's Hercules, based on the film and by THQ instead of Capcom. We get notes on various levels, including a map of the Valley of the Hydra. Now. Throughout the 16-bit console generations, and even before that into the 8-bit NES era, Capcom put together some of the best adaptations of Disney properties, both television, series, and films, on consoles and on handheld devices. DuckTales, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, Aladdin, you name it. So... Well, this time I'm taking a look at THQ's take on Disney's Hercules, and it is crap. Not just by comparison to the earlier games, but with comparison to the work it is adapting and how it adapts that work. I appreciate the hyper-fluid Prince of Persia style animation in the game, but it doesn't work for this source material. Hercules is a, is a demigod. He is a heroic figure um, with above normal human physical abilities. So if you're playing demigod Hercules for crying out loud, it feels like to me, you should have more superhuman abilities than say the Prince of Persia. Um, particularly in the case of this game where you, it's also, it's only giving you one life. If nothing else, this would be a situation where the ideal option would be to give the player the character Standard platformer character maneuverability, the longer jumps, uh, the floatier jumps, 
some ability for in-air maneuver and that sort of thing. This like this gives a narrative justification for why a platformer character moves the way that they do. Um, like particularly considering like by contrast, many in the film, many of the Herculean labors like fighting the Hydra are covered in a montage, not in a big standout thing. So yeah, this definitely feels like a case where doing this in a, like giving the character abilities, which might seem normal for a platformer, um, actually feels, uh, fits in and creates a sense of verisimilitude. Hercules should jump higher than an ordinary man. Hercules should be able to run a little faster than an ordinary man. Uh, quicker reflexes, hit harder, that sort of thing. I should have, and these opening levels have um, scorpions and snakes be trivial opponents as opposed to significant major enemies. In short, this game is very much a bloody mess, and it's a damn shame, especially considering what both Capcom had done before, and even Sony ImageSoft had done, uh, where creating a game where the character in the work felt like the char character from the source material. So there we are. Classified information, we get some really hard to read exclusive controls or cheats that let you play different characters in some of the early levels of Shadows of the Empire, uh, particularly the ATST during the Battle of Hoth and the Wampa and a Snow Trooper in Echo Base. In now playing, we still have no also rants this issue. Wrapping things up in Pack Watch, we have more information on Goldeneye, along with a Game Boy James Bond game coming up as well. Duke Nukem is coming to the N64, and I'm kind of interested to see if it's a straight up adaptation of Duke 3D on the PC, or if it's a more original title doing a 3D platforming take. So alas, while we have Pokemon cover this issue, it is definitely not out in the US yet, so it's <laughs> it's um not available to review. So I can't pick it. But what I do but of the games I do have, Star Fox 64 is the winner. Um, I would have liked the game a bit better, as I mentioned earlier, if it had some more forgiving targeting, uh, better, more active auto lock on or something to that effect. But otherwise, the game is, is fine. Uh, it's certainly the best title of the games I covered this issue. Next issue, we should expect to be shaken, not stirred. As we have GoldenEye 64 coming up. See you then. You did, Bob! <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.